morning, everybody. I bring greetings from Pendennis Good News Church. If you don't know where that is, if you go up the Staple Hill to Down in High Street, turn left at the old Sanctuary Church, now the International Church of God. That's Pendennis Road, and Pendennis Good News Church is down there on the right-hand side. We ourselves live just the other side of Hillfields Estate on Acacia Road, so it took me about three minutes to get here this morning. <laughs> I was born in what is now the Red Bus Nursery on Down End Road. That was a, a maternity hospital. And grew up in Eastville, and I went to Whitfield Church, which is now the Metropolitan School in Fishpond. So I'm quite a local boy, uh, but the Lord has brought me to marry Rachel, and we've been here, there, and everywhere. And 10 years ago, the Lord chose to bring us back to Bristol. So it's great to be with you this morning. As I was considering what to preach on, I really felt that it would be right to preach on unity, and I was thinking where to go, obviously John 17, that, that priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus came to mind. But last week we had a wonderful occasion, we had a baptism, and the Lord led me there to preach on that we're saved by grace from Ephesians 2. And as I looked at the passage that follows that passage that we looked at last week, it spoke about unity. So it's great to follow on from preaching that passage last week to go into Ephesians 2 starting at verse 11. Verse 11. And we'll consider this theme of unity. Unity with God and unity with one another through Christ. So the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, says this. Therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household being built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Let's pray again. 
Father God, this is your word, breathed out by your spirit for your people. And we ask now that you would do us good and bring glory to your name through this wonderful passage. We thank you for it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm sure you've seen on the TV programs that look into people's pasts. Maybe celebrities and they do the research and they they delve into the history and they find out where they have come from. There's now websites where you can research your family tree. This is very important to know where you have come from. To fully understand your personal journey. And it's very important for us to know as Christians to know where we have come from. And to understand all that Jesus has done. To make things so very, very different for us. The Apostle Paul has already reminded the church in Ephesus that they were dead in their trespasses and their sins. We sang about that at the beginning. We were dead spiritually dead a dead person cannot help themselves we are totally dependent upon the grace and the mercy and the kindness of God to come to us and to wake us up to make us alive in Jesus you can do nothing to make yourself good enough for God it's all the work of God's grace through Christ and here he wants them to remember he says it twice at the beginning He's speaking to a church that were Gentile in background. That means they were not of Jewish descent. By interest, is there anybody here who is Jewish? Not one person. So when you and I, Paul is speaking to you and I exactly the same as he's speaking to this church in Ephesus over 2,000 years ago. You and I were not born into a Jewish family. Not part of the chosen people of God. Formerly you who are Gentiles by birth called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision. Now, Jews became a little bit snobby about this. The Jews were God's chosen people. God, all the way back, started with Abraham. He called that one man and said, Abraham, through you and your family, I am going to bless All nations, not just one nation, not just Jewish people, but through you, all peoples. Now, rightly so, God said to his people, you are to be set apart. You are to be holy. You are to be distinctively different in the world. Therefore, I'm giving you laws. These laws will help you to live as my people, obedient to me and be a light to the nations. You are to be separate. You're not to intermarry with the Gentile people. You're not to worship their gods. You are to be distinctive as Yahweh's people. Now Israel failed on two counts. In one regard, they became snobbish. We're the circumcision group. You're the uncircumcised That was never the heart of God because God's heart was for the nations to see that his people were special. They were loved. They were cherished. They were God's people. And for others to want to be a part of that. But they also failed because they did intermarry. They didn't didn't say distinctively holy. They intermarried. They worshipped the gods of the Gentiles. They failed. But because they were one time Gentile people, these Ephesian people, like you and me, Paul says, remember, you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. A Gentile couldn't just say, right, now I'm a Jew. Now I'm one of God's people. They were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And because of that... This awful line, they were without hope. Have you ever felt hope 
less. It's an awful situation to be in, isn't it? To feel like there is no hope for me. But that is the situation that everybody without Christ is in. If you do not have Christ, if you're not God's people, you are without hope in the world. So Paul is reminding them, look, this is where you were. This is your situation. And then comes this wonderful, glorious line. But now. There is a change. And it comes in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. How? By the blood of of Christ. You see, the Jewish people were known as the circumcision because circumcision, as we've been told here, that done in the body by human hands was a cutting off of the flesh. It was a sign that you belong to me. You male Jewish person are one of God's special people and everybody who comes from that person, their family, their offspring, are part of the covenant people of God. Is it better if I hold it? Sorry. Now here the change comes. In Jesus and his blood. You see, Jesus was the one who was cut off Jesus blood was shed that you might be part of God's people the Bible says that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins it's not the shedding of a foreskin it's not the 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 killing of bulls and goats that forgives us of our sin it is only only the blood of God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that can bring you near, that can forgive you of the one thing that separates you from eternal God. And Jesus was willing to come and be cut off for you. You can be forgiven. You can go go from having no hope to having All hope, every hope, not through anything you and I have done, but through what Jesus has done. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace. You see, we have peace with God through Jesus, but Paul is also concerned about a peace between humanity. That There's a vertical peace between us and God and a horizontal peace between one another. He's made the two groups one. Before in the Old Testament, there was this barrier. There was this separation. There was this hostility between Jew and Gentile. And now there is peace between them if they come to Christ. He has destroyed the barrier. He's destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in his flesh the law and the commandments and the regulations. You see, now there is no need for circumcision. To say you are a child of God or part of a family of the child of God. Now you are a child of God in Jesus. And so there's no need for circumcision. That was one of the key things in in the New Testament. The letter had to be written from the church in Jerusalem and sent around to all the churches that Paul was preaching at, including Ephesus, saying there's no need for it. You don't have to do that, Gentiles, to be one of God's people. All you need to be a, a child of God is faith. In the Lord Jesus. So Jesus sets aside this. And along with that, all of the other regulations, the food laws. If you ate certain things as a a Jewish people, you were classed unclean. Or a woman in their menstrual cycle, unclean. And Jesus comes not to abolish the law, but Jesus comes and fulfills the Old Testament law. 
in every way. And so we don't obey laws rigidly saying, yes, I've, I've done that one, I've done that one, I've done that one. Oh God, aren't I a good person? Don't I deserve your love? No, we are accepted because Jesus has fulfilled every law. Jesus obeyed the whole law. And now he sets it aside. bring Jew and Gentile together in me. And it's very sad that on the whole, the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, have actually rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. All through the Old Testament, it was pointing that God would send a king. God would send his, his rescuer. And on the whole, the Jews rejected him. They crucified him. And even still today, don't we see now the consequences of that in the conflict and the ongoing hostility between Jew and Gentile in the very land of Israel? Palestine and Israel. This literal dividing wall down between them and rockets and missiles and fighting between Israeli and Arab. Why is there that hostility? It's on the whole because neither of those two groups, Arab, Muslim, and Jewish, Israeli, have not come to Christ. It's not politics that's going to bring peace and unity in that land. It's them coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And both Palestinian and Israeli will hug each other and say, I'm a brother and sister of yours in Christ. It's then the physical walls will come down. It's then that the the missiles will stop. We're reconciled through Jesus to God through the cross. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, to Gentiles and to you who were near, to the God's own people who should have been expecting the Lord Jesus. For through him, we both have access to the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through him. So let me say this morning, have you stepped onto the way? Have you truly accepted Jesus as your Messiah, as the Savior of the world? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Unity and peace with Almighty God and you'll have hope in this world and hope beyond this world and then you enter into a family of God people of every tribe and tongue and language it's a joy for me this morning to see people here this morning from different cultures I'd love to see Pendennis Good News Church reflect more in that way our society our culture So let me encourage you to go on building unity with one another. Whoever walks through these doors of yours, you know, we're both our churches are on the edge of a needy estate. Maybe some of you come from it. Whoever walks through that door, in fact, no, don't wait for them to walk through the door. We've got to go to them, haven't we? James speaks very, very strongly about favoritism, judging people by what they look like, by what they wear, by the car that they drive. You know, if we're in Christ, we are one. We are brothers and sisters. And I'm so pleased that we've had prayer for our brothers and sisters around the world. We've got to show unity, not just the monks, kind of people that are like us, It's so easy, isn't it, maybe for white middle-class Christians to get alongside well with white middle-class Christians. 
We may do church differently. But it's so good that the churches in Staple Hill and Mangotsfield and Fish Ponds today are showing that we're one in Jesus. Let's continue to pray into that and build on that. So verse 19, he says, consequently, because of this, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. You know, folks, constantly remind yourself of that. I think this is what Paul is saying. You've got to remember. You've got to remember. That's why Jesus gave us communion, because we easily forget, don't we? And communion, every time we take it, reminds us, Jesus died for me. And Paul says, don't just rejoice in where you are. Don't just rejoice that I'm forgiven, I'm a child of God, but you remember where you came from. You remember the the hopeless situation you were in. You remember that if it hadn't been for Jesus coming into this world and dying for you, you Gentile people would not be God's people sitting here today. And so what does that do? What should it do for us? It should give us a sense of gratitude. It should give us a sense of humility. Thank you, God, that you so loved me. Thank you that you loved Gentile people. Thank you that it was always your plan to work through Abraham, through Israel, to bring a Messiah that would bless the nations. And then what do we read in Revelation? People from every tribe and every tongue and every language worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that was slain for the world. The furthest place I've been from Bristol is a tiny village in Papua New Guinea, which if you don't know where that is, is north of Australia. We worked there for a couple of years and it was my joy to leave the mission base we were on, travel for seven hours on a rugged road in a four by four into the mountains of Papua New Guinea Guinea, to a tribe that lived like they almost lived for millennia in huts made of whatever they gather from the forest. And there is a church. And the minute I greeted them, or they, more, more in the case, they greeted me, I knew there was an instant bond. It was so felt. It was so real. You are my brother and sister in the Lord Jesus. We come from different continents, different sides of the world. You are a completely different color to me. You speak a different language to me. You live in a completely different house to me. Different standard of living, but we are one in Jesus. So we're fellow citizens of, with God's people. Members of his household. We come into the house of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What a privilege we have as people of God. We have a foundation. We have the Old Testament, the New Testament to build ourselves upon. To know God. To be closer in relationship with him. And who is the chief cornerstone? Who's the one that ties the building together? Again, it's Jesus. And in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. What's the purpose of the church around the world? It's to be built together to be a holy temple in which God lives by his spirit. What was the purpose of the temple? It was the place where God's people worshipped him. The church united around the world needs to be knit together, joined together, built together and to be an evident place where God is worshipped. And then he says in that final verse, verse 22, and in him, you too. I think he's, he's first of all pointing to the whole church and then he's saying, look, and you too, Ephesian church. And let me say this morning, you too, life church. You are being built together. Now, I don't know this church. The first time I've walked in this building, Gareth's not told me the ins and outs of this church. But let me say, in Jesus, this church is to be unified. This church is to be one in Christ. This church is to be 
knit together, built together, grow together, roots sinking down, life growing up, healthy, vital. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a member of his body. 1 Corinthians 13. And every part of a body has a important job to play. So if you consider yourself a child of God, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, a part of this church, you are a member of Christ's body. And because of that, first of all, you should be holy. Just turn to, if you've got your Bibles there, turn to uh, chapter 4, verse 17 in Ephesians. Paul says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Hang on, Paul, you've just been telling us that we are Gentiles. Yes. But remember, you've been brought into the household, the family of God. Remember what you were and you're not to live like you did. You're not to live like those who are still outside of Christ without hope. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that's in them due to the hardening of their hearts. They've lost all sensitivity. They've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity. And they are full of greed. Folks, you are the people of God. And just like Israel of old were to be distinct and holy and separate, we are to be different. My pastor used to say we're to be deliciously different. Not different in an odd sense, you know, so people point out to your, you know, your work, your work colleagues, he's the Christian. But rather your colleagues say, he's a Christian. That guy who's so loving and so faithful to his wife and his kids and always the first person to support a colleague holy but in a delicious and appealing way and then it's back to the 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 body imagery if we're part of God's family we are to be serving the body using however God has made me to serve the whole so my little finger you might think well it's not much use I could chop it off. But you know, the rest of the body would suffer if my little finger didn't do its job. Our bodies are wonderful. They're intricate. They're interconnected. They work together to make us function and thrive. And that's the church, the body of God. So are you serving? Don't be a consumer Christian. You've been brought near, right close to be a healthy, thriving part of this church. And let me say one more thing. Don't be a, don't be a nitpicker. You're complaining. Don't be a church hopper. I don't quite like the way that they play that music I don't quite like the way they serve that coffee well, whatever it is we can be so nitpicky as Christians we live in a consumer age don't we if you don't like Tesco well just go to Morrison's and if you then don't like Morrison's just go to Sainsbury's and we can go on and on and on and on and hey if you don't even like going into a store just sit at home and choose it all on Amazon But church can be like that, folks, and it shouldn't be. How can we build a unified family if the family members keep leaving the minute they're upset? How can we build a family together if we sit at home watching it upon our screens? That's not to say some people that might be watching from home for... Seriously, we, we, have it, we have it at part of our church, people that physically can't make it church. What a blessing the internet is. But if we, if we use the internet as an easy option, oh, I, I'm a bit tired today. 
let me stay in my PJs and watch from home. You can't be serving your brothers and sisters in Christ if you're not here. Now you've got a new pastor, fairly new. Get behind him, love him, pray for him, support him, ask him, how can I pray for you? Ask him, what can I do to build the unity in this church and to cause it to grow? So folks, we have such a wonderful privilege being God's people. We're not what we were. We're not dead. We're not separate. We're not without hope. We're part of the family of God. And we're to be built together in Christ for the glory of God and by the Holy Spirit. Hold on to those things. Amen.